something fell from the sky, and when Tony looked closely, he realized it was his own missile. However, it was too late to run, and the terrifying shockwave blew him dozens of meters away. An ordinary person wouldn't have survived such an explosion, but Tony was no ordinary man. Thanks to his body armor, though he survived, shrapnel still pierced his body, and blood was flowing uncontrollably. This was just the beginning of his nightmare. In his blurred consciousness, he felt as though his insides were being twisted, and the excruciating pain made him scream. But then, someone covered his mouth and nose, and he passed out. When he woke up, he found himself in a horrible state, with a tube inserted straight into his lungs. It took him a long time to pull all the tubes out, and after three days of no movement, his limbs were stiff. He wanted to drink some water, but he couldn't reach the bottle, not knowing whether the man in front of him was good or bad. Tony cautiously turned over but felt something tugging at him. When he looked down, he saw a car battery connected directly to his chest. Panicking, he peeled back the bandages and found a circular piece of metal embedded deeply into his chest. He didn't know what had happened to him, but he was sure his life was over. He asked the man what the thing in his chest was, and the man replied, Without it, you'd already be dead. It turned out that Tony's veins were filled with shrapnel, and the electromagnet in his chest was preventing the fragments from reaching his heart. This meant that for the rest of his life, he'd be dependent on the car battery to stay alive. Even so, the warlords who captured him were not satisfied. They ordered him to build a missile. This missile, once launched, would split into countless warheads, each capable of precise targeting with destructive power comparable to a nuclear weapon. It was Tony's greatest creation, but if it fell into the hands of these warlords, the world would know no peace. Tony refused, so they tortured him, submerging him in water to try to break his will. He was tortured countless times, but what was worse than the physical torment was the mental strain. The warlords took him out of the cave, removed his blindfold, and the intense sunlight blinded him momentarily. When his vision cleared, he was shocked to see piles of weapons, all designed by him. His original intent was to protect peace, but now his designs were being used as tools for world domination. At that moment, his beliefs shattered, and he questioned everything whether he was right or wrong, but regardless of the answer, he knew he couldn't let these thugs succeed. The second in command promised him freedom if he complied, using materials from their stash. On the surface, Tony agreed to their terms, but inside, he knew he was as good as dead anyway. So why leave a legacy of shame? He began a hunger strike in protest. Ho Eenson, his cellmate, urged him that instead of choosing death, he should think about doing something for the world. His words woke Tony up. Yes, even if he were to die, he should make them pay. The warlords believed Tony had changed his mind and were willing to meet any of his demands. Thus, Tony began his revenge plan, starting by solving his mobility issues. To do so, he dismantled an old missile, tossing aside the multi-million dollar core without hesitation, because all he needed were the metal plates. Each plate weighed zero, 15 grams but required one, 6 grams of material. This meant he had to dismantle at least 11 missiles, melt the metal down, and mold it into rings the size of bracelets. After precise welding, he completed a long-lasting electromagnet, though it was only the size of his palm. It could release 30 billion joules per second, providing enough energy for Tony to live for thousands of years. But Tony's ambitions didn't stop there. He stacked the blueprints, revealing a design for a humanoid machine. It turned out he was building the first wearable mech suit. To avoid suspicion, all the parts were made separately. So at first glance, it looked like he was building a missile. It was a brilliant strategy, deceiving his captors into thinking he was fulfilling their demands. The warlords monitoring him suspected something was off the parts didn't quite match the photos but they didn't understand what they were looking at, assuming it was just an improvement. But one day, the warlord leader realized something wasn't right. This kid wasn't doing what he was supposed to. He stormed into the workshop for a surprise inspection, finding nothing wrong with the blueprints. He decided to go after Ho Eenson instead. He heated a piece of metal and threatened to shove it into Ho Eenson's mouth if he didn't speak. But Eenson refused to give in. Tony warned that if Eenson were harmed, they could forget about the missile. The leader, reluctantly, put the metal down but issued a final ultimatum. Finish the assembly by tomorrow, or they would be shot full of holes. Quickly, Tony completed the helmet. He wrapped bandages around his hands, put on a leather jacket, and a scarf to absorb the shock. Then... He donned the thick armor, directing Ho Eenson to help with the remaining parts, all while staying in the blind spots of the security cameras. The warlord leader, 
Sensing something was wrong, sent a subordinate to check on them. Little did they know that Tony had already planted a bomb at the door. The moment they forced it open, it exploded. The blast created a large hole in the door, more effective than expected. But the armor needed time to power up, and the warlords were pouring in. To buy Tony time, Ainson grabbed a gun and charged out. Knowing full well he'd be shot down, he was quickly gunned down after only a few steps. But his sacrifice wasn't in vain. With the progress bar full, Mark I finally came to life. The lead warlord turned around just in time to be knocked back dozens of meters. The remaining three were terrified and fired wildly in Tony's direction. But finding him meant their end. He took down two with his fists, completely ignoring the bullets, and easily dispatched the third. At that moment, he was like a steel death machine, plowing through the enemy's firepower, slaughtering them mercilessly. The warlords panicked and slammed the iron gate shut to stop his advance. But soon, they would realize it was all pointless. Tony's left hand got stuck in a crevice and couldn't move. To make matters worse, someone had already aimed at him with a rocket launcher. Tony quickly pulled himself free and dodged, knowing it was time to settle the score with the warlord. However, the warlord wasn't easy prey either he had already armed himself with heavy weaponry, ready for battle. As soon as Tony stepped out of the cave, he was hit by a rocket. Luckily, he dodged just in time to save himself. Tony immediately counterattacked, though his aim needed improvement. Fortunately, some falling debris hit the warlord dead on, but unfortunately, Hoeinson was barely hanging on. Hoeinson wasn't dead yet, but he was about to go reunite with his family in heaven, and with that, Iron Man was fully awakened. Tony marched out of the cave, heavy footsteps echoing as he withstood a barrage of bullets. Once the enemy ran out of rounds, it was Tony's turn to strike. Flames erupted from his arms as he tore through the enemies, leaving no mercy for these scumbags. Still, that wasn't enough to vent his frustration, so he turned his rage toward the weapons bearing his name. If it wasn't for him, he wouldn't have been captured. If it wasn't for him, these warlords wouldn't have their weapons. If it wasn't for him, Hoeinson wouldn't be dead. The more he thought about it, the angrier he got, until he set the entire weapons cache on fire. But there were still heavy machine guns on the mountains, firing at him relentlessly, causing Tony to stumble. His leg armor was also damaged. Desperately, he detonated the last of the munitions and activated his jet thrusters, shooting into the sky. In an instant, the entire base was engulfed in flames. Explosions followed one after another, yet there was no sign of Tony. Finally, Mark I emerged from the inferno, cutting a graceful arc through the air, only to run out of fuel and crash hard to the ground, scattering parts everywhere. Luckily, Tony survived. He dragged his nearly destroyed body through the desert, just as he was about to lose consciousness. Two rescue helicopters flew overhead. That's how Tony was saved. But his first act upon returning home wasn't to go to the hospital, it was to hold a press conference. When he announced the shutdown of his weapons division, deciding to focus on new ways to benefit humanity, what did he get? His business partner's strong objections, brutal attacks from the media, and even sarcastic remarks from his friend, Rhodey. Without the glue of shared profit, friendships proved to be shallow. But none of this could shake Tony's resolve. At the same time, a crazy new idea formed in his mind he would build a new suit of armor. Mark II. The first issue he needed to solve was energy. So, he created a miniature reactor capable of generating 10 billion joules per second. But there was a problem. The old unit had a loose wire. If it short-circuited, he'd be dead in seconds. Tony had to calm Pepper down, guiding her through the process of removing the wire. Pepper, trembling with fear, reached into Tony's chest. Luckily, the wire was successfully removed and all that was left was to insert the new reactor. Pepper asked what she should do with the old one. Tony said, destroy it, burn it whatever, I don't want any reminders of it. Now, it was time for the most critical step, designing Mark II. Building off Mark I, he made it lighter and sleeker, since the propulsion system in Mark I was flawed. He focused on improving the leg thrusters first. Soon, it was time for the first test flight. Everything was set, and the hand controls were activated. The thrust system was adjusted to 10%. And in a sense, it worked. The only problem was that the balance system needed improvement. Tony quickly figured out a solution, adding thrusters to the hands to increase counter thrust. But the test failed again. After 11 days and 37 attempts, Tony finally got it right. This time, he started with just 1% thrust, and the results were surprisingly good. He then increased it to 2, 5%. Everything was going smoothly until, out of nowhere, a malfunction in the leg system caused him to lose control mid-flight. He crashed, 
burning half of a million dollar sports car and ruining his design plans. Fortunately, he landed safely. Next, he reinforced the legs, donned the helmet, and loaded the AI into the system to handle object recognition and targeting. With everything ready, it was time for the most thrilling part, assembly. This time, no manual labor was required. The suit's components were automatically installed, one piece at a time, until the armor fit perfectly, conforming to Tony's body. But just as Tony was about to celebrate, Jarvis doused his excitement with cold logic. Jarvis reminded him that precise calculations were needed before actual flight tests could begin. Tony, of course, ignored the advice and insisted on starting the test. With the countdown complete, Mark II took off, rocketing forward at an insane 300 meters per second, breaking through the base in a flash. The sensation of soaring through the sky was indescribably exhilarating. Even though Tony was having fun, he didn't forget the purpose of this test he needed to familiarize himself with the armor's full capabilities. He started with the visual and targeting systems, spotting two kids eating ice cream as he passed by a ferris wheel. One of them accidentally dropped their ice cream, which sparked an idea in Tony's mind. What if I fall? He thought, inspired. He came up with an even crazier plan. He switched from horizontal flight to vertical ascent. Yes, he was going to test the suit's altitude limit. Ignoring Jarvis's warnings, he continued to climb higher and higher. At 40,000 feet, the suit's surface began to freeze, and the leg thrusters failed. The suit lost all power and started to plummet. If Tony couldn't defrost the suit soon, he would become nothing more than a metal pancake. Worse still, even Jarvis had gone unresponsive. At the brink of life and death, Tony had no choice but to manually deploy the flaps. As the ice melted away, Mark II regained power. Just a meter from the ground, Tony pulled up sharply, narrowly avoiding a crash. People say geniuses are crazy. And this time, it proved true. He returned to the base without further incident. But Tony quickly discovered another flaw the suit was too heavy. Afterwards, with a swollen head, Tony returned to his workshop feeling dejected. It wasn't until he saw a message from Pepper that he remembered it was his birthday. Pepper had given him a special gift the old version of the reactor, with a heartfelt inscription engraved on it. No longer downcast. Tony got back to work on Mark III. He quickly figured out that the icing issue was caused by the pressurization of the suit's outer shell. The best solution was to switch the materials to satellite-grade gold titanium alloy, which would also reduce the weight of win-win. Just then, he overheard on TV that his company was holding a charity gala, but he hadn't even received an invitation. He decided it was time to show his face. But when he arrived, he discovered he had been kicked off the board. That wasn't the worst part. What made him angriest was the news that Hoinson's hometown was being attacked by a terrorist organization using weapons he had made. Fuming, Tony confronted his business partner, who didn't even care to respond. It turned out that Tony's removal from the board was his partner's doing. Under the guise of protection, Tony was furious and vowed to make the terrorists pay dearly. He began adding weapons to Mark III while developing the flight stabilizer. He had accidentally discovered its powerful offensive potential by improving it and solving the recoil issue. It was no longer just a stabilizer it was now a repulsor. Watching the TV, seeing the displaced refugees, Tony couldn't suppress the anger swelling in his chest any longer. The terrorists, for every town they colonized, were reaping astronomical resources. They plundered, murdered, and enslaved the men for free labor, while the women became breeding tools. Anyone who resisted was killed. At that moment, the small town of Gomorrah had become a living hell. The refugees could only dream of someone coming to save them, but there were no police here, and certainly no rule of law. A little boy screamed desperately as he watched his father about to be executed. Just as all hope seemed lost, that familiar figure appeared Iron Man. Tony ignored the bullets flying his way and, with a single punch, sent a thug soaring. A quick repulsor blast took care of another one behind him. One by one, Tony took them all out. But to his shock, the terrorists resorted to using women and children as human shields, threatening him to surrender. As Tony let go, he already had a plan. One by one, he locked onto the scum. In the next moment, all of them were taken out simultaneously. His heroic figure left an indelible impression on the boy who had narrowly survived. Meanwhile, the warlord hiding in the shadows thought he had narrowly escaped. But he was wrong. Tony grabbed him, dragged him out of the building, and threw him into the crowd of refugees. Then Tony soared into the sky, aiming to destroy the enemy's weapons cache, only to be hit by a missile, sending him crashing to the ground. As Tony got back on his feet, another armor-piercing round came his way, but he narrowly dodged it. In return, 
Tony sent a gift back to the tank. The battle resumed. Bullets clinking off his armor. Without hesitation, Tony took to the sky and locked onto three missiles at once. One repulsor blast. And the missiles exploded, turning the enemies to dust. Tony burst out of the flames, thinking the trouble was over, unaware that the military had locked onto him. Colonel Rhodey immediately contacted Tony, not wanting to reveal his identity. Tony played dumb. Rhodey issued the command to shoot him down. And moments later, two fighter jets roared into the skies a chase had begun. Tony accelerated with a deafening sonic boom, breaking the sound barrier at a stunning Mach 2. But even so, an F-22 fighter jet locked onto him. Missiles launched and streaked toward Tony, but he was prepared. Firing off countermeasures, the missiles collided mid-air in a fiery explosion. The fighter jets missed their mark and switched to heavy machine gun fire. Tony's flight became unstable as bullets rained down on him. He deployed his flaps again, causing the jets to assume the target had been eliminated. Little did they know, Tony was hiding under one of the jets. However, the impact from earlier had caused a malfunction, and Tony lost his ability to fly. He confessed to Rhodey, only to be spotted by one of the pilots. The jet rolled to shake Tony off, but the trailing jet paid the price its wing was torn off in the process. The pilot ejected, but his parachute got stuck and wouldn't open. In a critical moment, Tony rushed over to free the strap, ensuring the parachute deployed safely before speeding off, leaving only a trail behind. Rhodey passed the incident off as a training exercise, fooling the media. Though not everyone was deceived, Stain immediately rushed to the scene, revealing that he was in league with the terrorists. The warlord showed him the remains of Tony's Mark I, hoping to exchange the design plans for more suits. But the warlord underestimated Stain. Stain activated a sonic weapon, paralyzing the warlord on the spot. Stain then ordered the slaughter of everyone in the camp. Meanwhile, Tony was unaware of any of this. He instructed Pepper to go to the company and steal the weapon's transaction records. He wanted to erase all the mistakes of the past. Pepper, fearing for his safety, refused. Tony was heartbroken. He wasn't after fame or fortune anymore. He just wanted to save those endangered by his weapons. He questioned why Pepper would leave him at this critical time. Tony urged Pepper to help him. And upon hearing his plea, Pepper finally had a change of heart. However, while she was retrieving the data, she accidentally discovered an earth-shattering secret. There was a video of Tony being kidnapped. It turned out that the attack had been orchestrated by none other than Stain, a true wolf in sheep's clothing. But Stain's ambition didn't stop there. He ordered his men to miniaturize the arc reactor to power his iron munger suit. But the scientists told him it was impossible to replicate. Stain, infuriated and ruthless, decided if they couldn't make it, he would just take it. He waited for Tony to let his guard down then paralyzed him using a sonic device and ripped the arc reactor from his chest. Without it, Tony would die of heart failure within 15 minutes. Stain wanted him to fully experience the agony of dying slowly and even threatened to kill Pepper. Tony, of course, wouldn't just give up. Don't forget, he still had that old arc reactor the one Pepper had gifted him, but his limbs were stiff, and he could barely stand. He was forced to crawl, dragging his body across the floor. He struggled to lift himself using a box for support, but his strength was fading fast. As he lay there, seemingly at the end of his rope, the box suddenly slid into his hand his robotic arm had helped him. At that moment, Rhodey arrived, telling Tony that Pepper had gone to arrest Stain with the authorities. Tony was instantly filled with dread and immediately suited up. Now, his only thought was to protect Pepper at all costs, but the situation was even worse than Tony had imagined. The Mark I reactor only had enough energy for 15 minutes of flight. Even worse, the Iron Munger had already awakened. It quickly took out all the police officers and headed straight for Pepper. Thankfully, the Iron Munger was too large to fit through the doorway and got stuck. Pepper thought she had escaped, but then she heard a noise behind her. Turning around, she saw that the Iron Munger had taken a shortcut. Bursting up through the ground, Pepper was on the brink of death. But Tony arrived just in time. A massive battle was about to begin. The Iron Munger lifted a car to smash Tony with it. Tony wasn't backing down either. He fired a repulsor blast from his chest, sending the Iron Munger flying and catching the car in the process. But the panicked driver slammed on the gas, pushing Tony forward. Tony barely escaped the frantic driver, only to be hit by a heavy blow from the Iron Munger. By this point, Tony's power was almost depleted and he could only take the hits. The Iron Munger tossed him aside and then hit him with a rocket. Mark III's defenses were holding up, but Tony's plan to take the battle to the skies didn't go as expected. The Iron Munger had also been upgraded and could fly. So Tony decided to show him what it really meant to fly high. With a light punch to the Iron Munger, Tony sent him into a free fall. As expected, 
the iron munger plummeted and was about to crash to the ground, becoming nothing more than a hunk of metal, but Tony's triumph was short-lived he was falling too. Thankfully, he still had a backup power source. If he conserved it, he should be able to land safely. Tony thought the fight was over and removed his gloves, but a metal fist suddenly appeared behind him it was the iron munger. Things had taken a turn for the worse. Tony dodged a punch, but as soon as he tried to retaliate, he was sent flying once again. Now out of energy, Tony was no match for the Iron Munger. His repulsor beams and missiles had failed, but at least his flamethrower still worked. He managed to disable Stain's targeting system and took the opportunity to escape. But he knew this wouldn't last long. Tony contacted Pepper, telling her to overload the arc reactor to blow the roof, while he would lure the enemy into position. But before he could do that, the Iron Munger caught up with him, and his helmet was destroyed. Stain wasn't letting up he unleashed a barrage of gunfire at Tony. Luckily, Tony had already disabled Stain's targeting system, and the rocket barrage missed. Pepper was ready to overload the reactor, just waiting for Tony to clear the roof. But he couldn't move. As the energy beam shot into the sky, Stain lost consciousness and fell into the reactor, where he and the Iron Munger were obliterated. Tony lay motionless with only the faint flicker of the arc reactor in his chest indicating he was still alive. A week later, Tony was released from the hospital, and Pepper had arranged a press conference, worried that he might say the wrong thing. She even thoughtfully prepared a speech for him. At first, Tony managed to lie through his teeth, blaming the incident on a bodyguard's malfunctioning robot. But when the reporters pressed him with questions, he almost let the truth slip. Rhodey quickly reminded him to stick to the script. I am Iron Man. But this life-saving device in Tony's chest was also pushing him closer to the edge. The palladium in his system was poisoning him, and to delay the effects of the toxin, he had to drink nearly four pounds of sour green juice every day. Knowing his time was running out, he decided to complete five insane plans. First, he descended from the sky in his armor, soaring above a sea of fireworks in the night sky like a god. With the flashy debut of Mark IV, the crowd went wild. This was his first plan to make sure more people remembered the name Iron Man. He ditched his usual low-key style and openly demonstrated the process of removing his suit. With a sense of high-tech flair, he let the world know that as long as he was around, there would be peace. But that wasn't enough. He also reopened the Stark Expo, providing a platform for all those with dreams of technological innovation. Everyone was cheering with joy, but no one saw the man behind the screen. When the dazzling armor came off, he was just a dying man. His blood toxicity had already reached 19%. The use of the suit was accelerating the deterioration of his health. The once famous playboy now shunned the attention of beautiful women, only signing autographs for young fans and then hurriedly leaving the venue. He moved on to the second plan asserting his authority. Since Tony publicly revealed his identity as Iron Man, the military had been eager to acquire the suit's technology to prevent any future threats. In a military hearing, Tony confidently argued that he and the suit were inseparable, and handing it over would be tantamount to betraying everything Iron Man stood for. He then hacked into the live feed, showcasing footage of countries attempting to replicate his Iron Man suit, every attempt resulting in catastrophic failure. Tony concluded that Stark Industries' technology was at least 20 years ahead of the rest of the world, a statement that left the government officials furious. A senator, losing his composure, began cursing him. But Tony, unfazed, put on his sunglasses and casually walked out. Beneath his bravado, though, there was a deep bitterness, one that he couldn't share with anyone. Every time he replaced the reactor in his chest, it was a reminder that he was inching closer to death. In public, Tony acted like nothing was wrong, but when Pepper walked in, he quickly swallowed down his chlorophyll supplement to hide his worsening condition. Pepper questioned why Tony was going to such great lengths to host the Stark Expo. Tony, trying to appear lighthearted, tossed a model into a virtual trash bin and replied casually, If you're not happy with my decisions, you can run the company yourself. This marked his third plan, to step down from all his responsibilities. It wasn't so much a plan as it was his way of tying up loose ends before he died. Tony had become a hands-off leader, and his physical condition was deteriorating rapidly. Perhaps it was the fear of dying with unfinished business or a desire to stay in the spotlight one last time. But he proceeded with his fourth plan, entering a high-profile car race. At first, he was nervous, but once the car roared to life, his nerves disappeared, and he even started to feel a rush of excitement. He accelerated, leaving his opponents in the dust. Unbeknownst to him, danger was fast approaching. A disheveled man, disguised as a staff member, entered the track. As he revealed the arc reactor on his chest, 
Similar to Tony's, he ignited his outfit with an energy whip. Tony had boasted that his technology couldn't be surpassed for 20 years, yet Ivan had created something just as powerful with ease. Ivan stood in the middle of the track, wielding his energy whips, and with one swift strike, he sliced a car in half. Happy and Pepper rushed to the scene, hoping to deliver Tony's portable suit before disaster struck. But the danger was already upon them. Before Tony could react, his car had been whipped into two pieces and sent flying through the air, crashing violently to the ground. Thankfully, Tony remained conscious. As he stared at the man approaching him, Tony knew he had finally met his match. Even as explosions erupted behind Ivan, he remained unfazed, walking steadily towards Tony determined to kill him in front of thousands of spectators. But just as Ivan's whip came down, Tony dodged at the last second, avoiding certain death. He quickly scrambled to his feet, but Ivan knocked him down again. Tony barely escaped multiple whip attacks, each strike coming dangerously close. When Ivan was about to land the final blow, Tony made his move. He laid still, watching Ivan from the car's rearview mirror. Just as Ivan's whip was about to strike, Tony sprang into action, narrowly escaping once again. Ivan's whip hit a fuel tank, causing a massive explosion. Both men locked eyes through the flames. Tony was panicking, while Ivan, untouched by the fire, smiled. Tony couldn't believe it was this man even human. At that moment, Happy finally arrived, slamming his car into Ivan, pinning him against the barricade. Tony thought the crisis was over, but as soon as Happy opened the door, it was ripped clean off. Despite the intense collision, Ivan was still alive. Realizing one hit wasn't enough, Happy rammed the car again, but even the airbag didn't take Ivan down. Finally, Tony got his hands on his Mark V suit. This was at the moment everyone had been waiting for. He kicked the car door open. Ready for his one-on-one -on -one battle with Ivan, Tony tried to fire his repulsor beams, but Ivan interrupted him with a whip. Since the suit was portable, its defense wasn't as strong. With his left arm compromised, Tony resorted to attacking with his right. However, Ivan's energy whips deflected every blast from Tony's repulsors. Then, things got worse. Ivan wrapped his whip around Tony's neck and right arm, slamming him to the ground and disorienting him. The Mark V suit was in shambles, but Tony didn't give up. If he fell, who would stop Ivan? A sense of duty surged through him, and he started to fight back. Wrapping Ivan's whips around his own body, Tony advanced through the electrical surges, closing the gap between them. Two punches later, Ivan was down. Tony removed Ivan's arc reactor, ending the fight. But something was off. Why was Ivan's arc reactor the same as his? And even though Tony had one, Ivan taunted him, saying he had lost. Confused, Tony asked what he meant. Ivan revealed that his true goal was to bring Tony down from his pedestal. Once the world saw that Iron Man wasn't invincible, they would turn on him. Ivan added that dying from palladium poisoning was a horrible way to go. Tony was shocked. How did Ivan know about that? After further investigation, Tony discovered that their fathers had once worked together, co-developing the arc reactor, but Ivan's father had been accused of espionage and was deported from the US. In 1967, upon learning the truth, Tony's emotions were in turmoil, but the bad news kept coming. His friend Rhodey informed him that the military was preparing to storm his home and seize the Iron Man suit, but Tony didn't even react not because he didn't want to, but because he couldn't move. The last battle had worsened his condition, and his reactor was worn out. The palladium poisoning had spread to his neck. He didn't want anyone to see him in such a pitiful state, so he ordered everyone to leave. Even worse, the palladium levels in his blood had reached 89% meaning that tonight might be his last birthday. So, he got drunk, letting himself go completely. Not only did he dance awkwardly in his Iron Man suit, but he also publicly demonstrated how to urinate in the suit. As if that wasn't enough, he began recklessly firing his repulsor blasts, seeing Tony spiraling out of control. Rhodey finally couldn't stand it anymore. The party ended in a disastrous battle between the two, with Tony slumping in a corner. You'd think he was really drunk or just acting recklessly, right? But no, this was actually part of his fifth plan, to give the Mark II suit to Rhodey. Otherwise, knowing Rhodey's sense of duty, he would never have accepted Tony's gift. Now, finally, someone else could shoulder the burden that Tony had been carrying, eating his favorite donuts while sitting on a giant donut. This was Iron Man's darkest moment, with the palladium poisoning deep in his bones. Tony showed no interest when S.H.I.E.L.D. Director Nick Fury tried to recruit him, after all. Saving the world wasn't something a dying man should be worrying about. But then something unexpected happened. The toxins in his body suddenly began to retreat. Natasha Romanoff, who had just injected him with lithium dioxide, explained that it could temporarily alleviate his symptoms. However, 
Unless he found a replacement for the palladium, the outcome would remain the same. Tony let out a bitter laugh finding a new element sounded easy enough. But if it were that simple, would he still be dying? Nick handed him a box, telling him the solution was inside. Skeptical, Tony opened it to find his father's old belongings. At first, Tony didn't think much of it, until he heard a life-changing message from his father. In an old recording, his father said the model in the box had the potential to change the world, but the technology of the time couldn't bring it to life. He then revealed that his greatest creation wasn't the arc reactor, but Tony himself. This realization hit Tony hard his father's love, though never outwardly expressed, was deep and profound. Tony had no right to give up on himself now. Inspired, Tony set about executing his sixth plan, to complete his father's unfinished work. He couldn't shake the feeling that the model resembled something, but he couldn't quite place it. The inscription on it was equally perplexing. To uncover the truths, Tony scanned the model, generating a vacuum digital wireframe for projection. He enlarged the central sphere and began constructing protons and neutrons. Suddenly, a new element appeared before his eyes. Tears welled up in Tony's eyes, he was overwhelmed with emotions. This new element was the key to replacing palladium. But since it couldn't be synthesized artificially, the best solution was to dismantle his home and upgrade his existing technology. He tore down walls and rebuilt the electrical systems, single-handedly taking on the role of an entire construction crew. Before long, the platform and particle accelerator were set up. Using Captain America's vibranium shield as a leveler, everything was perfectly aligned. He cranked the power to full capacity, and a blue beam of energy shot out cutting through walls and steel beams. After nearly burning down half his house, the beam converged on the target, emitting a brilliant blue light. A new, unknown element had been created. Just as Tony was on the verge of a breakthrough, his enemy, Ivan, wasn't sitting idle either. Hammer, who had long coveted Tony's Iron Man technology, had freed the deranged Ivan and declared that Iron Man would soon be history. Ivan modified Hammer's suits into drones. Thanks to this technology, Hammer quickly gained favor with the military and even participated in upgrading the Mark II suit. However, Colonel Rhodey wasn't easily fooled. No matter how advanced the weapons Hammer presented, Rhodey remained unimpressed. Frustrated, Hammer brought out his ultimate weapon a high explosive device he jokingly called the ex-wife. Rhodey, unsure of what to choose, decided to take them all. Hammer, thinking his time had come, planned to betray Ivan and get rid of him, but as soon as Hammer left, Ivan killed the guards and contacted Tony, threatening to destroy the Stark Expo in 40 minutes. Tony knew Ivan wasn't bluffing. Desperate, he decided to test the new arc reactor on himself. To his surprise, it worked far better than expected. As the reactor in his chest glowed brighter, the palladium poisoning visibly receded. Meanwhile, the Stark Expo had already gathered thousands of attendees, with Hammer proudly showcasing his army of land, sea, and air drones, the modified Mark II now known as War Machine, made its grand entrance as the final act. Suddenly, a loud whoosh echoed through the air Tony had arrived just in time. Mark VI landed with style, and the crowd erupted in excitement. But Tony wasn't here for fun. He quickly ordered Rhodey to evacuate the crowd. However, it was too late. All the drones simultaneously turned their weapons on Tony. It was all part of Ivan's plan. Every drone, including War Machine, had become his ultimate killing machines. Tony saw the situation and quickly soared into the sky to avoid collateral damage to civilians. All the aerial drones immediately pursued him. And luckily, Rhodey was providing support by reporting targets. As even the Mark VI suit wouldn't withstand concentrated fire for long, Tony led them on a wild chase while thinking of a solution. But soon, things got worse the land and sea drones were deployed too. The Navy began launching indiscriminate attacks at the Expo, and the Army set up mortars, all targeting Tony with a barrage of fire. Thankfully, Tony dodged just in time, or he would have been finished. The entire venue was in chaos, and one of the drones locked onto the little Iron Man fan in the crowd. But just as the drone prepared to attack, the boy raised his arm calmly, as if ready to fight. At the last second, a figure dropped from the sky. Yes, it was none other than the future Spider-Man. He engaged the drones, zipping through the parking lot. As another drone met an unfortunate end, Tony came up with a plan to end the chaos. But first, he needed to dodge this wave of attacks. He pushed his suit to full power, dashing ahead as explosions trailed behind him. Eventually, Tony broke free and dove low telling Rhodey to stick close. Calculating the flight path, Tony ascended rapidly, pulling up just before smashing into a giant ball-shaped structure. The drones couldn't react in time and were destroyed by his maneuver. Once grounded, 
Tony and Rhodey started fighting for real one suit under Ivan's control, trying to kill the other, and Rhodey desperately trying not to hurt Tony. How could they fight like this? The turning point came with Natasha. She infiltrated Ivan's hideout, and using her exceptional combat skills, she quickly neutralized the guards. Natasha then hacked into the control room. Although Ivan wasn't there, she reactivated Rhodey's suit and checked Tony's vitals, finding everything normal. It seemed death had finally let him go. But Pepper overheard the conversation and began to worry. The two started bickering from afar. Though now wasn't the time for playful arguments. With the enemy closing in, Tony quickly reawakened Rhodey, and the two devised a plan. Rhodey suggested using his heavy weapons from a high vantage point while Tony lured the drones in. But before they could act, the enemy drones landed first. Now, there was no need to argue. The battle was on. Back to back. Tony and Rhodey fought off the drones. Tony fired his repulsors, striking down any drone that got too close. Rhodey, true to the name War Machine, unleashed bullets like they were going out of style. The two were so in sync that they became each other's shadow, never needing to worry about threats from behind. All the enemy drones were destroyed in no time, though this strategy could only work once. Just when they thought it was over, another figure descended from the sky. It was Ivan. The crackling sound of his electric whips sent chills down their spines. But Rhodey had his secret weapon, the ex-wife. With the launcher ready, Rhodey fired the device straight at Ivan. Tony locked onto Ivan's vital points. But disappointingly, the missile didn't even scratch him. Ivan countered with his whips, easily taking out Rhodey's prideful weaponry. Seeing this, Tony tried to sneak around. But Ivan saw right through him, slamming him into the ground. Rhodey provided cover fire, only to get choked by Ivan's other whip. Tony rushed in to save him, but his punches were useless. He ended up in the same situation, tangled in Ivan's electric whips. Ivan now had them both where he wanted, intent on wearing them down. But something about this moment felt familiar. Rhodey quickly caught on. They unleashed a combined attack. With their energy beams crossing paths, the energy dispersed, leaving Ivan barely conscious. In his final moments, he muttered, You've lost. As soon as he said those words, the arc reactor on his chest began to beep rapidly. Tony glanced around and realized all the remaining drones were doing the same. Pepper was in danger. Without hesitation, Tony and Rhodey shot into the sky, racing to save her. At the expo, Pepper stood frozen, staring at the beeping drones. The beeping grew faster, and just as the drones were about to explode, Tony arrived. He grabbed Pepper just as the drones detonated, and the entire expo was engulfed in flames, though both were unharmed. Pepper was overwhelmed. She wasn't afraid of death she feared that one day. Tony wouldn't make it out alive. Frustrated, she found countless reasons to resign. Tony, unable to argue with her, silenced her with a kiss. But the first kiss didn't quite go as planned. So he was ready for another when he noticed Rhodey awkwardly standing by. Rhodey, having accepted his new role, pretended not to notice. Later, Nick Fury approached Tony again, offering him a role as a consultant for S.H.I.E.L.D. Tony agreed but had his own terms. And so, the senator who had been a thorn in Tony's side became the one handing out awards to both Tony and Rhodey. In the end, Tony basked in the glory of his well-deserved victory. I'm a movie enthusiast. Please subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you next time.